And we are recording. Welcome to the CTSC webinar for May 22, 2017. I'm your host, Jeanette Dopheide. CTSC is the NSF Cybersecurity Center of Excellence, and these webinars are part of its mission to deliver high-quality, actionable guidance regarding cybersecurity to the NSF community. More information about CTSC can be found at trustedci.org. Today's topic is Technology Transfer to Practice the NSF TTP ecosystem with Emily Nichols and Alec Yassensack. Before we begin, I have a few items to note. First, this presentation is being recorded. Second, participants are welcome to ask questions during the session using the chat box. Um, and we also uh, allot for time for extra questions at the end of the presentation as well. And having said that, I will hand the microphone over to Alec. Alec, welcome. Uh, thank you very much for hosting. Uh, very, very glad to be here today and uh, to talk about the uh, TTP process. Uh, can we have our first slide? The, the reason that we are here today is that the National Science Foundation is uh, moving forward the uh, TTP process to help move more of the NSF-funded research in cybersecurity into the field. And, and Emily and, and at Internet2 and uh, myself and, and the colleagues here at the University of South Alabama have parallel programs to try and promote that uh, process, and that's what we'll be briefing separately today. And I have two slides to introduce that concept to you, and then I'll turn it over to Emily. Uh, let's go to the next slide. Uh, the, the notion here is that we are going to promote uh, academic uh, research being transferred into the marketplace, and there are two approaches to doing that. Uh, University of South Alabama will be promoting the academic PIs uh, taking that research product out of their laboratory and putting it into the marketplace in academia uh, or in the commercialization or in industry uh, through startups, through licensures, uh, or through other vehicles to be able to get those products out of the laboratory and into use. Uh, the, the first program it, with academic PIs consists of a program of familiarization going around to different venues and promoting uh, the TTP process to the PIs, training those PIs on how to make that happen at, with uh, workshops at different uh, venues, and then also advising folks in, as they prepare uh, their plans to do tech transfer. Similarly, the Internet, too, is doing the similar thing in, in purely the, in the uh, cyber infrastructure environment of universities, where they will be working with PIs that are building campus infrastructures doing the same type of work of familiarization, recruitment of uh, folks to do that work, and then of training those people uh, to make that happen. Uh, what uh, the regular, the target, the ultimate target of both of these efforts is to increase the number of proposals to the SATC uh, solicitation from National Science Foundation under the TTP designation. The, the TTP designation is a component of the regular SATC solicitation, and it pays for investigators simply to transition existing results into practice. And that operational environment can be, again, commercial, government, or academia. So that is the ultimate goal that, that Emily and I are promoting here on this venue today. And so I believe with that, I am going to turn the uh, microphone back over to Emily and let her present the work that Internet2 is doing in that ar uh, arena. Emily? Wonderful. Thank you so much, Alec and Jeanette. Thank you so much for hosting us today. Um, as Alec has already indicated, we're both very excited to be here and we're looking very much forward to the opportunity to share what it is that we're up to with participants today. So at Internet2, um, we have a great as Alec has mentioned, around cybersecurity transition to practice acceleration. And before I get into what the grant is and how we're, how we're going about working with it, I wanted to give a little bit of background as to sort of how this came about. So I'm part of the Chief Innovation Office at Internet2, and it was formed a little over two years ago when um, 
Senior Vice President for Innovation, Florence Hudson, came on board. She did a survey with, their, with the Internet 2 members, trying to understand what was important to them from an innovation standpoint. And a couple of things were identified in that survey. One was around end-to-end -end trust and security. A second area was around Internet of Things. And a third area was around distributed big data and analytics. And you'll see in the diagram there that there is a fair amount of overlap amongst those three. And, and that's okay because we can, get to, we can get further faster together by working together. And one of the things that was identified as a use case, particularly for the end to end trust and security group, was around cybersecurity. With, um, Anita Nikolic, our program officer at NSF, actually joined the end to end trust and security working group. And then we had some conversations with him. That's where this eager opportunity came about for matchmaking opportunities. And then we also have some special interest groups related to the use cases that have been identified as well around smart campus, smart grid, ethics, uh, trust identity, privacy protection, safety and security for IoT, as well as cybersecurity, which is what we're going to be talking about today, and healthcare and life sciences genomics. So that just gives you a little bit of backstory as to how some of this conversation started to happen. And Internet2 is a member-owned consortium representing a little over 300 universities here in the United States, as well as having relationships with a number of regional networks, uh, international, national research and education networks, as well as industry partners. And while, yes, um, ALEC is focusing a little bit more on the commercialization and working with industry partners. That is an option for folks via our grant as well. However, we'd probably be referring most of them to be working with ALEC on his end. But we represent, we have approximately 370 individuals within our collaborative innovation community that come from over 160 different institutions. And they, these are really good testing ground opportunities for cybersecurity research that's in development and helping it get into practice a little bit faster. So what is our, what is our eager grant? It's an early concept grant for exploratory research. And then, as it says, the challenge is to accelerate into practice the later funded, later stage funded cybersecurity research into an RE environment. Because Internet 2 represents so much of the RE community, it was a really nice fit for us to be working on this grant. So we've got a couple of things that we've already gotten the, the works on what we've been doing. We've gone through an NSF cybersecurity research inventory. I've been working with a very large list of SAS CPIs trying to find some opportunities and research assets that would be ready to be tested um, into the environment. And I apologize, I, I am fighting a little bit of a sinus infection and cold, so I apologize if my audio is, is a, a little on the low side, but um, I will get a little bit closer to the speaker. We've also been interviewing researchers and practitioners as part of the research that we've been doing to understand what their asset is, where it is in the pipeline, uh, what their ultimate goals are, because as we've been finding, not all researchers necessarily want to get into commercialization. They might just be looking to solve a big problem um, in, the, in the marketplace. So that is one of the things we've also been doing. As I've already mentioned, we're able to leverage the Internet2 community for uh, matchmaking opportunities finding places within the community where a researcher can actually take their asset, deploy it on a campus network, and get that early user feedback. Uh, we've been doing a lot of these matchmaking opportunities via webinars. Uh, we've done, we did one last fall, and then we just completed a showcase as part of our spring meeting at Global Summit in uh, Washington, D.C. last month, where we had a whole host of different researchers. Jim Masney, who's on the line as well, was one of the um, researchers that came and actually presented his work uh, at that showcase. And then we're also trying to understand what are the needs and gaps within campuses and researchers. What are researchers working on? What is it campuses need? And finding ways to pull all that together. 
And then on the right-hand side of the slide, you'll see some scientific impact and broader impact um, uh, capabilities for this. You know, clearly, the main goal is to take cybersecurity NSF-funded research and get it out into the marketplace to make cybersecurity safer for not just campuses in our community, but for the world. And then we're also working as part of our outreach efforts with a lot of the local Society of Women Engineer chapters, local NSBE chapters, et cetera, trying to build that pipeline for cybersecurity going forward. So we started our grant last August, August of 2016. And you'll see here we have a little bit of a project plan uh, that we've been putting together. And we're tracking very nicely against it. We, uh, we did a couple of webinars. I've got a whole host of webinars scheduled for this summer, um, one every month starting in June, where we'll be bringing in a cybersecurity researcher to talk about their, their asset and how that, um, what it is and how it can be deployed within a campus environment. And we did our first workshop, as I mentioned, last month in Washington, D.C. We're also going to be looking at some matchmaking portal opportunities. That, that is probably going to be more of a focus for us for year two of our two-year eager, but that is absolutely something that we will be trying to do and, and make it available to everybody to not only get their research assets into a portal, but also to get those matchmaking opportunities pushed forward. So we, as part of our grant, we've also been conducting a whole host of different interviews with folks, trying to understand what would be important, not just for practitioners, but also for um, researchers as well. So some of the things that have been identified by cybersecurity researchers was that funding from NSF and others was really important to them to further their research, to make it a little bit better, but also getting that early user feedback, finding alpha and beta testers to help them kick the tires, improve it, um, perhaps help them prove theories around where their research is headed and make it better a little bit faster. And so these deployments are absolutely critical to the acceleration of transition into practice. It's much like you know any other commercial practice where you know the sooner you can get that feedback and test it, the better the product will be at the end of the day. So there are whole different opportunities for accelerating at different steps, whether it's at ideation, whether it's at actual code writing, when they actually have something that is ready to be deployed. There are a couple of different areas um, for the matchmaking opportunities throughout the life cycle. And then it also was found out to be important that they need to be able to leverage all the different funding opportunities available to them, whether it is through NSF, whether it is through um, THS, they have a transition to practice program as well, whether it's through i or whether it's multiple agencies funding these research opportunities and helping them push it along. Um, and then some other interesting feedback that we received was that sometimes it can be a little bit difficult to go after some of the TTP dollars, whether it's for NSF, THS, et cetera, and that upon occasion, researchers, rather than go through the grant writing process, would actually work, prefer to work directly with venture capital firms. And some of the researchers that I've been speaking with have been doing that directly. And as I mentioned, Transition to practice isn't necessarily everyone's goal, and that's okay. We need people out there looking at the bigger picture and finding ways to solve some of the next uh, big problems. And it's not necessarily important to everyone to actually go out and start a business. So from a pilot deployment standpoint, some of the things that we found that were important is that for campuses to actually be deploying something on, uh, in their network, they would like to know what would be needed, whether there's certain hardware, whether certain software needs to be deployed on their campus network in order to leverage an asset uh, for deployment. Um, we, one of the really interesting things we found when we started to launch this program last fall was that it's not necessarily a big campus or small campus situation for these assets. Uh, frequently, smaller campuses 
might have a little bit more flexibility and bandwidth actually to be doing some of these more experimental cybersecurity deployments. There's a little bit less red tape for them to have to go through to actually do the deployment. But then conversely, there are those who might not be as interested in doing an experimental deployment on campus. Uh, we had um, the former CIO from University of Wisconsin-Madison present with us in Washington last month. And his first rule of thumb for cybersecurity researchers who want to work with even just their own home campus is don't break the network. And then rule number two, when you forget that one, go back to rule number one, don't break the network. So that is absolutely very important to the folks who are going to be deploying cybersecurity research on their campus. And then from an agency standpoint, there are cross-collaboration opportunities, particularly as it relates to NSF and the DHS, because they do have similar and complementary programs specific to cybersecurity transition to practice. So as I've mentioned, we've done a number of webinars. Uh, we did a workshop last month with, with a showcase and an ongoing recruitment mode of finding researchers who are interested in having their cybersecurity research asset shared with other folks, whether it's via a webinar, much like the one we're doing today or the ones that I have planned for the summer, or whether it's via an in-person workshop. We're actually looking to do some regional workshops come um, the fall. The timing and locations are still to be determined, but we're very much in partnership with community members to bring that together. Um, and then, you know, this is really all about the researcher and positioning them for success. We really want them to, to go forward. So sometimes some of the feedback that I know folks received during the Washington workshop that we did was, you know, making sure that they have a very cl clear value proposition for the practitioner. What, it, what problem it is that their asset is actually going to be solving for the campus whether they need to put together a user handbook. Again, those operational requirements. What level of user support is available to, to a practitioner? Um, frequently, the, it's a researcher, a couple of PhD candidates, and maybe one other folk. So it's not necessarily a very large operation. And, and campuses understand that. It might just be phone and email support upon occasion or absolutely no support at all because everybody has their day jobs in addition to the grant work that they're doing. And then we'd also like to be able to leverage a, a virtual organization to pull together cybersecurity researchers and practitioners for what it is that they need and what's available to them from the research community. So as I mentioned, we did a, a, work, a webinar last fall where we brought in a gentleman from Stony Brook University to talk about some cloud storage capabilities he had, as well as a gentleman from Colorado State University talking about name data networking. And one of the things that we do, much like today, is record those webinars and make them available um, on a wiki site that we've made available to everybody. So the presentations and the recordings are available to everyone. And then I have uh, some upcoming webinars you'll see in June. I've got Mr. Basney coming in talking about his CI logon, which was a really big hit in Washington last month. And then a gentleman from North Carolina State University talking about power grids. And then a young woman from University of Michigan talking about network security capability. And one of the things that we have found is it's not just one type of cybersecurity product that might be of interest to folks. With the workshop that we did in Washington, we were able to pull groups of folks together in a couple of different areas that, so that they were more topically oriented, whether it was around identity and access management and network security, smart grid, cloud security and storage, data analytics and security, or Internet of Things. That is absolutely something that's starting to become much more important to folks as we go forward. So this is my plug to you all, the, uh, the folks on the line. If you have a researcher 
or a cybersecurity researcher you know, within your organization or that you know someone or you yourself and you have something that you think might be interesting to be tested within the cybersecurity and campus networks, please, please let me know. I'm, as I mentioned, I'm in ongoing recruitment mode, whether it's for workshops, webinars, or even a, an in-person event in uh, September, or I'm sorry, in October out in San Francisco, much like the event we just did in Washington, D.C. So please feel free to reach out to me uh, at the email addresses provided, and I'd be happy to talk with you about your work. And so with no further ado, I think I'm going to hand it over to Alec. Alec? Thank you very much, Emily. I appreciate that. And um, it's, it's been a great project, and uh, working with Emily and Florence and, and the National Science Foundation. And let me move right on in to my presentation, and we'll have a, a 15 or 20 minutes certainly at the end for questions for, uh, that we'll both be glad to address, and, and we may have others that can provide us some feedback as well uh, in the webinar chat. So the acknowledgments are, are to uh, National Science Foundation. Uh, for providing the resources to do this, and this comes uh, out of uh, uh, SATC and, and ACI, where Anita Nicholas is uh, uh, a program officer, and it came with two uh, workshop grants that got us going and uh, that several of the folks on this call attended and provided in, uh, information and feedback, which then went into a guidebook, which is the fourth bullet on the slide that's on the screen, uh, and uh, then uh, created this, uh, the Eagers that uh, are, are, are funding the, the work that Emily and, and I and our teams uh, are doing. And so uh, it, uh, thanks to, uh, to Anita and to National Science Foundation for making this happen. What, what we're talking about here, really, to be clear, is just getting this academic research into operation, into practice, and it does, people generally think of commercialization as being the way that TTP happens, and you talk about venture capital and about create, doing startups or maybe a spinoff or, or even licensure, but there are so many ways that, that TTP that can be meaningful to National Science Foundation and to the country, frankly, uh, as taxpayers, uh, is uh, either in, in the government, where we work with government agencies to put the, uh, the research results into practice, or in academia, where many of the folks on this call are, in the, some of the centers, the supercomputer centers, the Internet 2 type projects, and the places where academic research can be so meaningful and can move forward the agendas uh, of the organizations uh, and, and of, uh, of the country, again, in, in general. So what we're really talking about is putting research into practice. And the way that, that we've chosen to do that is by, by trying to help investigators think about TTP and then to facilitate their, their success in their TTP efforts. Uh, it's a, a discernible result is what has to be uh, uh, attained. You can't take an idea and commercialize it. You can't take an idea and create tech transfer. It has to be a discernible outcome. And that outcome really needs to be able to be, to be able to be discernible, you can tell that if, it's, if you can establish intellectual property for it. If you can put some type of protection on it, then that product is essentially available for TTP. Uh, and then, of course, the final thing is it has to be productive use. Nobody will use it. And, and this is what happens in many, and, and having been in government for many years, and producing products that were directed from above that nobody ever used because the end users didn't see the value or didn't have the value in it. And it's what Emily was speaking about earlier, that the products to be taken into TTP need to be consistently reviewed with a user base and that early adopter identified and engaged from the get-go and, and to be able to make the uh, uh, the transfer occur and the transfer be effective. So those are the three things you need, a discernible outcome that's predictable, and then it has to have an identified production, productive use by society. Uh, as I mentioned, kind of ran through some of the different uh, TTPs that people think of, and certainly we are helping to promote startups. Uh, we have folks that are engaged and, uh, and resources to help people understand what commercialization is about. Uh, licensure that uh, would allow you to have a product to not necessarily have to leave the, the PIs would not necessarily have to leave the comfort of their 
academic position or if it's an industry researcher that has access to NSF uh, uh, grants and, and awards opportunity, then they wouldn't have to leave their position. They could simply create the licensing. Spinoffs, which are affiliation with a major sponsor that is a not not necessarily a new new uh, entity, but that has connection and, and a uh, a funding source right out of the chute. Uh, the open source market is also a place where we have interest, and where as long as that open source venue can put that product into productive use, that's a a, a approach that we also will uh, promote and champion. Uh, and then informal TTP, where we have a, uh, an adopter and we have a way of targeting a marketplace uh, with a product that is not necessarily as formal as the commercialization uh, or industry uh, contract or, or licensure uh, model. We uh, spend a lot of time talking with investigators in the academic community about why they should engage TTP. Uh, a lot of investigators are hesitant to do that. But the bottom line is having your work in use in society is a credential that you can uh, count on in a lot of different ways in your uh, career. And I counsel, as, as the dean of the School of Computing here, I counsel young faculty members all the time that, that being in the laboratory is not enough. Having people using what you do uh, is critical. Citations of your papers is a start to that. But actual use of that product in a laboratory environment, by others in a laboratory environment, or by, by uh, uh, the, the government, a, a, one of the three-letter agencies, uh, DOD, DHS, uh, Energy, uh, other places, that's the real codification of the value of your work, is if it actually makes a difference in society, then that creates a career that is uh, that is what we really want to see our faculty members producing. Uh, it also, and, and this is something that people may not recognize that is of tremendous value, not just to the investigator, but to the organization, is, is these grants that are possible to do TTP give you a footprint in, at, at NSF. They make you a PI. They give you a grant that, can, that you can add supplements onto, that you can put uh, uh, REI-type uh, uh, expansions onto, and so uh, it's a, a really nice uh, opportunity to create, uh, create an NSF footprint for folks that, uh, that are trying to get into that venue. Uh, there certainly is an opportunity for profit, but uh, if that's why you're going into commercialization, uh, that's the long shot. Make, uh, creating that company that produces Facebook or Microsoft or these other long-term uh, uh, big dollar uh, responses is, is pretty difficult to do. Creating a company that's stable and that produces longer term benefits is the, would be the goal and is a much, a much higher percentage and, and again we're trying, trying to provide resources that, that make that happen. The other thing that engaging TTP will do for you is to create as an investigator, as a faculty member, will create long-term industry connections. When you engage those industry folks that have interest in your area uh, as, uh, for TTP, then they become your colleagues. And, and the end of the TTP effort in this case will certainly not end the relationship uh, with those industry partners. It will just further it and, and make it uh, much stronger in the long term. Uh, it also creates opportunity for students uh, and the other things that, that all NSF grants do for you. Certainly there are risks to investigators. Uh, if you get out of the uh, academic environment and you get focused on doing the, some of the business and the marketing things that are required in your company and you quit producing publications and you quit mentoring students, uh, uh, then, then that can create a problem. And once again, part of, of my goal and my mission and our team here at South Alabama is to help investigators not have that happen, is to be able to do the TTP and to also continue to be, have successful academic careers. Uh, there's some financial liability that could occur. Again, we're a part of our, our uh, approach is to help you prevent that from happening. Uh, reputation, loss of family time, and stress are all parts of starting a business, of, of starting a capital venture like this, of reaching out to people and, and taking a chance and taking a risk. Uh, that certainly is a uh, part of the, the model that is involved in tech transfer. 
and um, and again, we will provide resources. And this is some; these are some of the things that make it a little bit difficult for academic investigators to go into the TTP. Uh, again, some of these impediments that we see are the hesitation and the lack of, uh, frankly, of ability to take a risk, or the willingness to take a risk of academic PIs. But more than anything, what we've found is that academic PIs don't understand the process. They don't realize that not only can they be, uh, can they be in the TTP cycle, but it can, it, they have resources and it can promote their careers. And so we're out there doing a lot of familiarization, much like Emily and, and the folks at Internet2 are out promoting TTP as a viable career process for academic PIs. It's also difficult for folks in academia necessarily to find clients. You may not have, you may have industry partners. Everybody that's out there and doing high quality research in academia, everybody has folks in industry that are circling around. But finding that client for the product that you have for the outcome, that discernible outcome, is a, is a challenging uh, thing to do for an academic, and particularly if you're talking about a mid-range uh, a, a associate professor that's not been around that long, finding the right client at the right time for the right product can be challenging. And again, that's part of what we're, the work that we are doing along with Emily and, and the Internet2 team to find folks that can put these products into use and these ideas into use. And then building a team for, for doing TTP is fundamentally different from building a team to do an academic research project. You've got all this business stuff out there that that computer scientists and computer engineers and, uh, and some, even some of the, the business people in the IS careers and the, and the, uh, uh, don't necessarily have all of the different marketing and accounting and, and understanding of how the, uh, the business models work for startups and for industry and for licensure. And those are things, again, we're trying to help. And I'm telling you, building production code is a major challenge, the ability to take student work and transition it into production uh, operational uh, capable code is a major challenge and that's part of the task that's on the plate that we've been asked to assist with and to provide resources, that type of resource to uh, investigators that are willing to engage this process. So uh, for investigators and for folks that are promoting investigators that are considering TTP, here are some guidelines, not a complete list. But it, uh, it, it is a way that you can look at whether TTP can work on a particular research outcome. What, and, and if you can't clearly define the product or service, that's a red flag right there. If you can look at it and say, what are we producing that can be used, then, and, and then that, that may be a viable product. Then the value proposition, how can that be paid for? So if you're going to an, an industry client, and, and I mean, a, a, a government client, and that government client doesn't have any uh, purse strings, or they don't have resources available that have the skills that are necessary to be able to get the product into use, and then to maintain that product into use in the long term, then it may have a, a difficult value proposition for the organizations that would be implementing it. And those are questions that, that you can identify up front. Price and performance. Who is the market? Who is the customer? How many people are in that market? Is it a brand new market? And that's a lot of times what academic investigators look for is an idea that is so novel that they're the, the first in market. How long will they be first in market? If it's a really good idea, it may not be very long. And so what is the ability to, to capture and sustain that market share? Uh, how many resources are going to be required? Can you build a team that's big enough? Can you build the right size team with the resources available? Is there enough money there to pay the team and to do the work that needs to be done? Uh, and then, of course, the, uh, the ROI and the risks are also important questions that need to be addressed. The vehicle that, that uh, we have chosen that we are, are targeting to promote uh, the TTP designation to academic researchers and industry researchers uh, is the uh, SATC TTP designation uh, option. And uh, most of you, I'm sure, are aware SATC is the uh, NSF's uh, uh, flagship uh, security uh, solicitation out there. And, and uh, it, there are several ways, that, several things that you can do in that, um, in that solicitation in addition to the mainstream 
a basic research and even applied research of the SATC proposal, uh, the education designation is one other thing that's available. That's not what we're targeting here, though. There's a separate designation called TTP designation. And what that allows you to do is to transition existing research results into practice. That means if an investigator has done some academic research and published the papers and created the prototype uh, work and, and, and they've done the, the, defended the dissertations and demonstrated the project to academic peers, maybe even demonstrated the project to industry partners, but not transitioned that into full use, then those projects are excellent targets for transition. We also are looking at projects that may be near completion and that may have uh, uh, an opportunity to get the final research done uh, in, during the term of the uh, SATC uh, uh, award that would occur, again, six months out after uh, the, uh, the submission, and, and that could be done. Some additional research may be done, but again, the case has to be made that the uh, work can be transitioned in some meaningful way uh, or, or moved forward in some measurable way to transition through this TTP designation. And so this is really my focus of my work here is to drive investigators that have interest and capability of doing tech transfer of their research into the SATC TTP designation. Uh, and and I, won't, I won't belabor these points. Simply put, to get the stuff into use, to get the, uh, those ideas into use, and to repeat myself uh, a third or fourth time, the, uh, the target of that, commercial, the, of that operational environment can be commercial, it can be government, or it can be in academia. Uh, the, the evaluation criteria and the solicitation, uh, again, describes the problem being solved. Uh, the target user group, and I tell people that you need to have an early adopter. You need to have to be successful, not just to win the award. To win the award, certainly you need to have a target group identified, but to be able to win the award and be successful in the TTP, you need to have a target user group that's agreed to adopt this product and put it into use. Uh, the deployment plan for that, the novelty, the idea, the team, uh, if you've got a good idea of your budget uh, and, and if you have a, tech, a relationship with your tech transfer office, which is very important, though, uh, you know, and we also offer opportunity to, to look at some best practices for dealing with tech transfer as part of our work. The bottom line is if you have a sustainability plan for a product, that's what the TTP designation is really looking for. If you can convince the panel that you're, this product can go into operational use and you can say that in, in, here's a five-year plan for this thing and how it's going to work, and if that's convincing, then you'll have a, a, a competitive uh, TTP designation. And, and I should probably put in a disclaimer here that I'm not at NSF, I'm not involved in these decisions, and I cannot make any promises, but but this is my interpretation of what NSF is looking for, is to be able to produce sustainability of that research and use. Uh, and I will, uh, I'm running just a little bit slow here, so I will skip through this. Uh, your project plan and your deployment plan are important in the TTP designation. I believe I've already covered all of that, and I apologize for the redundancy in my slides. Uh, the, uh, the important, uh, maybe the most important slide here is this. This is when uh, SATC is available for submission to the TTP designation. Medium projects are in November, small projects the first week in December. So there's plenty of time. Uh, if if uh, projects, research projects are coming to a close, recently closed projects, Forming the relationships with industry can happen over the next four or five months in order to be able to make a solicitation to this year's SATC uh, TTP designation uh, could happen. As a, a reminder of the SATC uh, provisions, the median projects are four years, and that upper end is $1.2 million. What PI would not want to have $1.2 million and four years to put their own research result into practice. It's just 
boggles the mind. I, you know, I would have given my teeth to have this kind of a program uh, 10 years ago when I was a faculty member uh, uh, trying to, to get this research uh, to work. Uh, and small projects are the three-year up to uh, $500,000. The ecosystem uh, that we are trying to uh, help construct along with uh, Emily and, and others that are working to try and make NSF more TTP friendly and more uh, TTP encouraging. The NSF has a long history of being basic research focused and they still are. But there is a, clearly a movement across the uh, federal government to take some of these research dollars and make the, uh, make the outcomes more obvious to society as opposed to the basic research which, which has a clear uh, uh, impact on society, but to make it more evident and, and more shorter term is what we want, is to produce an ecosystem that promotes TTP. Here are some of the services that will be provided, that's mentoring in terms of preparing a proposal uh, and in terms of conducting a project uh, if it, uh, after award. Best practices, uh, again I mentioned software maintenance, we co have concepts to help uh, to build and maintain software. Matchmaking assistance, as Emily already uh, covered, being able to find folks that can help you, uh, help PIs to take the uh, product into use. Contracting advice, which is things that computer folks generally don't do. Uh, we've been doing, as I mentioned, some of these things already, familiarization, matchmaking. Uh, we have lists now, mailing lists that you can get on the mailing list with, that we have to be able to send out information to PIs that are interested in this. Uh, we do training at the PI meetings, uh, and we uh, uh, have been presenting at numerous venues around the country where there are lots of, of NSF uh, investigators present. Uh, our mentoring service is, and we're looking for mentors, if any of you on this call are, have done the TTP thing and are willing to act as a mentor, uh, we, would, uh, we have two ways that we hope to do that. One is going to be an online mailing list and the other will be a contracting venue that would allow us to provide contact information to interested PIs that could be written right into the award. Uh, and so we have uh, a ways to connect mentors to PIs. Uh, topics that we're leaning on, the, uh, that we're working on with that mentor system is uh, to help understand how lean startup works, if you're actually going to do a startup, how staffing works, market analysis, and IP issues. We're working on this best practice repository, and if you have information that you can send us on TTP best practices, we'd be happy to have it, and they address many of those same issues. And we do have a, a uh, growing case study uh, repository that will help folks to get an idea of how others have navigated the TTP process. We're also looking to engage uh, peer uh, special interest groups that will have tips and tricks and frequently asked questions uh, along with our, our case studies. Uh, this is a bibliography that we've put together to give you some ideas on how the uh, commercialization works and, and hopefully that can be of use to you as you consider uh, a TTP or as you engage TTP projects that you may have ongoing. Uh, we have time for some questions now. I, I would like to make the point and to make sure that you folks know that uh, really the person that triggered this whole process was uh, Becky Bass, a colleague and friend of mine long time, and, and she has been, had been a, a, a very important part of this project. Uh, Becky passed away suddenly in March. Uh, we miss her uh, personally, and uh, it was a tragic loss to us and to the community. Uh, but we continue to engage this project actively uh, in, in uh, and the work that she did. We are continuing on and using her, uh, uh, her foundation to project this forward and, and to do the things that Becky would love to have seen uh, and that she would have been a big part of accomplishing had she not been taken away from us early. But uh, enough of that. Uh, I'll open the floor now to questions. And uh, Emily, are you back online and, and ready for the, uh, the onslaught that we expect from the audience? Ray, a rock and roll. OK. Well, uh, while uh, we give people a moment to type, um, let me just go over a couple of uh, details. First, uh, we've got Emily and Alex contact information here. 
But um, we've been following the presentation and kind of adding and tracking some of the, the various links that you guys have referenced. And so for those of you in the audience, these links in this pod that I just displayed are now uh, clickable. So you can just click on these or uh, just copy and paste this whole thing and save it in a note um, if you want to look at these things later. Um, in addition, uh, I just want to note um, a couple of things about the, uh, the next webinar. Oh, oh and uh, we have a survey. Pardon me. So uh, please take our survey and let us know what you think. And uh, one of the most important things you could do uh, for those of you who are filling out the survey is to let us know if there's more topics that you would like us to cover or if you would like to offer to present. We would be happy to receive that information from you. And then um, let me just briefly move these out of the way so I can show you what we're doing next month. Our next webinar is going to be June 19th at 11 a.m. And the topic is Provenance Assurance Using Currency Primitives and our speakers are Richard Brooks and Anthony Skellum. And that is all the, the notes and reminders that I have. So if anyone in the audience has some questions, uh, Jim asks, can Alec and Emily tell us about an NSF TTP success story? I think Alec mentioned that there's a library of TTP examples. I'll go uh, we you take the first half, and then I'll tack on at the end. So I, I didn't come prepared with success stories uh, at this point, um, uh, Jeanette. But but and we have not posted the library yet. But we are building that library of case studies, and we do have several historical case studies. But the TTP de uh, designation program is is new enough that we are are still looking for that first big hit. We do have several success stories of TTP that we are uh, putting together to be able to post on our web page, and, and we hope to have that out there soon. So Jim, in answer to your question about uh, TTP success stories, one of the things that we found when we first started doing some of um, our interviews with folks is that that was a big problem. Uh, it, that there was a major lack of success stories as it related to TTP. One of the main ones is a little firm called Bro, and we actually got on the phone with the folks from Bro and said, you know, how long did it take you to go from code to beta? You know, where, how long did, how much funding did you have behind you? What were the steps that you followed? And it took them, I believe, 20 years from start to finish to actually have something real. I'm like, hmm. That's a little bit of a problem. Um, we're looking to improve anything above 20 years. Uh, but with everything that's happening in the world, and you know, we've seen it over and over and over again, particularly the last uh, six to nine months, whether it was the, the attacks last fall, whether it was the, the hospital attacks um, in Europe and in, in, uh, in, in Asia Pacific, uh, uh, I guess a week and a half or so ago, and, there were, and some of that actually extended here to the United States as it took down FedEx operations, central operations on, in Memphis on the Friday before Mother's Day. Yes, I can testify to that actually happening and affecting my own mother's flower delivery for Mother's Day. But, you know, all joking aside, this is all very real and it's happening lightning fast. So, we really are very serious about making this go as fast as possible for everyone involved. It's going to help the researchers. It's going to help society. It's going to make cybersecurity safer overall for everyone. Um, so, Jim, hopefully that, that answers your question with some level of uh, detail. Yes, I too am looking for more success stories in the future, and I think, Jim, you might be one of our new ones very shortly with all the work that you've been doing around CI Logon. Uh, I'm hoping that we'll be able to have more to share with that, with you on that going forward because, you know, you were part of our workshop in, in uh, D.C. last month. Uh, hopefully you'll be able to be part of the PERC submission 
that we've put in for July and then the webinar that you're going to do, uh, I believe, next month with us as well. So thank you very much. Other questions on the line? Well, while we're waiting, uh, Emily, I just want to thank you for that uh, plug for the Bro Project. <laughs> I work on the Bro <laughs> Project as well. Okay. <laughs> And yeah, we, we are an open <laughs> we're an open source project, and uh, we are used across many institutions, uh, academic, government, and commercial. And when Alec was talking about these spin-offs, we have there are many um, security consulting companies that now use our product as a service or build their own products. Uh, so we're very proud of of the software that we've been building and. Uh, since we're talking about it, I'll just throw up our our website is bro.org, and uh, our conference BroCon is this September. So if any of you uh, in the audience are interested in um, uh, linking with the Bro community and learning more about it, uh, please go to our website. Okay. Well, um, it looks like our audience has. Um, has given us as much feedback as, as they're going to be giving today. Um, we still have a couple of minutes left. Uh, do you, uh, Emily or Alec, would you like to give us any uh, final thoughts or comments? If one of you, if you're talking, we can't hear you. <laughs> you yeah, might be on I, mute. I think we're okay. I just would encourage folks to really be thinking about the cybersecurity research and that they're doing, and whether it does qualify for TTP, you know, out out gives some really good indicators of what would be great for a TTP solicitation, or even if it's not part, it wouldn't be a TTP solicitation. Whether it be something that you would want to get out and tested within the, um, a campus environment, we very much would like for people to be thinking about, you know. What they're, what they're working on, how it applies to the big picture, and can make cybersecurity safer for everyone. Uh, Jeanette, I'd just like to add that the, just to emphasize that people need to understand the tremendous opportunity this TTP designation is. It, it is a, an opportunity you just can't, I mean, it, it just boggles the mind how much money it makes available to folks to do this tech transfer and how valuable it will be to the, to the investigator, that team that did the work, to the university, uh, and again to society. I just, it, it, it just, to me it just boggles the mind that we aren't inundated with, uh, with proposals to do this because it is such a great deal. So get out there and let people know if there are folks that do this kind of work, please pass this information on. and and, and uh, tell them to contact uh, uh, us, Emily or myself or, or Florence or any of the folks that are doing this program, and, and we'll help you get started and get this thing going. It's just a great deal. It really is. Yes. So thanks and for the we, opportunity. Uh, thank you for presenting. And uh, for those of you in the audience, we do make these uh, presentations available. Uh, we will uh, post the recording, and uh, we also post the slides. Uh, we, it just takes a little bit of time to get them archived. Um, but I will uh, be communicating that on our mailing list. So please, I encourage you to share this with, uh, with people uh, on projects that, that might want to uh, seek out this, uh, this funding. Um, and let's see, Randy posted um, Mingyan Liu's uh, startup company um, that she, she's from University of Michigan, and she just started a company around cybersecurity and insurance. And Randy uh, posted the link for us there. Thank you. Um, and she'll also be doing a webinar with us, I believe, in August around some of her other work that she's been doing. Yep. Right. And um, that, and we did post uh, a link here to the uh, to your uh, Internet Two webinars and workshops. Oh, so wonderful. With that, um, Emily and Alec, I want to thank you again for presenting today, and. Um, Oh, it looks like uh, Anita's typing. And um, uh, <laughs> yes, I agree. Great presentation, <laughs> and I'm excited to share this on our uh, on our mailing list. So please distribute this uh, to all your um, uh, coworkers. Um, again, Alec and Emily, thank you very much 
for presenting today. And um, with that, I will end the recording and uh, hope you guys have a great day. Thank you. Thank you very much.